Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, your host, and we are back with another Calgary Board of Education tr- School Board Trustee candidate for School Board Trustee Week. Uh, school Board Trustees are also being voted upon on October 18th. So along with your municipal councillors, along with your Senate candidates, the school board is also going to the ballot boxes on October 18th. Today, we have Ward 8 and 9 candidate Susan Vukdinovich. I apologize. I, 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 I had it right and then in the pre-interview and then I screwed it up there. But Susan, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Chris Brown. Um, Susan, uh, let's start off with the same question I've asked every single candidate who's ever come on the show. Where's your sense of duty to serve come from? My mom. <laughs> My mom volunteered a lot, and I just thought that that's what everyone has to do, that you have to do school and then you have to get a job and you also have to volunteer for your community. It's, it's just something you have to do. And my mom actually has a connection to schools. Um, my mother was a teacher and she moved to Canada in, uh, I, was it 1980? Yeah, February 1980. And uh, she, she was a Polish immigrant. Polish was her first language and she really wanted her daughters to learn Polish. So she worked tirelessly in the 1980s to convince the uh, Edmonton Catholic School Board to start a Polish bilingual program. She worked with, it was Minister David King at the time, um, was the Minister of Education working with Peter Lougheed. And yeah, she, she worked, in, her English wasn't her first language, which is especially impressive to convince the government to, to start a new educational program. And she taught at that school for many years. Wow. Um- you can give back in many ways, though. Like you said, your mother taught you volunteerism is what, where, what you should do if you're in, involved in a community. But in 2021, you've decided to put your name forward from elected politics. It's a completely different gambit. Uh, are you the sort of the black ball in the family to say, hey, I'm going to go out and put my name on the ballot? Or does politics run in your family? Politics doesn't run in my family. I'm the first one uh, running in my, my family. Uh, so I'm, I'm just learning as I go here. I, to me, it, it's interesting because I am running for office and I'm obviously a politician. In fact, I've taken great pleasure the last few times I've had to fill out a survey or something and, and I was asked for, uh, for occupation. I put politician because that, that is literally what I'm doing. I'm running for office, which makes me a politician and I own the term. But it, it's as a trustee, I really see this as just the next level of service from all the other work I've been doing as a volunteer in the school. So I was, um, over the the years, I was involved with uh, starting the before and after school care program at my kids' school. Then I was the chair of the uh, playground committee that built a brand new playground on the school grounds when the old one had to be dismantled. Uh, And then I've been school chair for many years. I've been involved with the Alberta School Councils Association. I've been involved with the, the CBE's um, Council of All School Councils, which is called COS, Council of School Councils. I, I've just been involved at, with school education issues as an as a involved parent and as a, as a community member for so many years. And you know, the more you do, the more you, you learn about all these different as, aspects of the education system, the more you learn about one of the things I really have a strong appreciation of uh, at this point, you know, at, with 10 years of volunteering under my belt is I really get how parents can have vastly different viewpoints on an issue and how important it is to listen to, to different parents and different groups of parents and weave together something that, that works for different parents or um, to have a very clear, very, to have very clear communications if, if something can't be done in a way that that um, that parents weren't originally hoping for because parents are bright. Like there, there's, we've got great people here in Calgary. A lot of times it's just a matter of properly explaining, like that. Yes, this would be great, but because of this constraint, this is what we have to do. People get that sort of thing. So I just, I really have this understanding of of what what's been happening out there in the education system over the past 10 years, what's been on parents' minds. And as I'm doing all of this volunteer work, I, I've gotten to a point where I realize I often know more than other people in the room just because I've heard it already. Like I'm, I'm catching up other people. And I thought, well, 
th this is really who you need for school trustee, right? Somebody who doesn't need to play catch up, somebody who doesn't have to learn it all from scratch, somebody who already can just jump in with two feet and just and just start doing the, the work of a trustee. Now, I was going to wait till later on to talk about this, but I thought, well, why not talk about it now? Because you you, you're sort of uh, talking about the issue, but not. Um, the last 18 months, 19 months has changed the name of the game when it comes to the school boards, mm -hmm. when it comes to how to ensure safety and ensure people are, our kids are getting the best education as they can around COVID-19 because COVID-19 has, has made schools a little bit awkward because there's in-person, there's online learning. How do you see your role as the school board trustee for Ward 8 and 9 moving into the new term? Because we're in the midst of a fourth wave. I think everyone will agree to that. There might be a few who don't, but we are in the midst of a fourth wave. How do you envision your role as school board trustee to ensure that our kids are getting the best education, but also no one's being left behind because of the online learning and in-class learning? Yeah, and, and a key part of that as well is to keep in mind is that education is an essential service. So the kinds of things that have to, any policies that are implemented in, uh, in schools, we have to keep in mind that every single child is welcome to CBE schools. That's what makes CBE unique, that there is absolutely every child um, will be registered. There's, there's no child who will be turned away. So given that we are an essential service, how do we, what is the, the right, where will the future take us? So the short answer to that is, I don't know. I don't have at this point an intended approach for COVID protocols and vaccinations because it is an evolving situation. And because it's a situation that requires medical knowledge, which school boards as a whole and school board trustees as individuals don't have. And I, I do want to reiterate that COVID protocols, mask mandates, vaccination policies are ultimately the responsibility of the government of Alberta because it's provincial politicians and provincial bureaucrats who have access to that expertise and that data um, and school boards don't. So um, I, I, I'm happy to see that a little bit more has been done by uh, the Honorable Jason Kenney, our Premier, and by the Honorable Adriana Lagrange, our Minister of Education, in the in the past uh, week and a half here. But uh, it's really that they we need to have them showing the leadership when it comes to public health measures in the classroom. So um, that's. A little bit of what I can say on that topic. No, but the understandable thing, because the, yeah. the reason I, the reason I asked that is because on your website, which will be linked in the show notes for anyone who's ever watched the show or listened to the show, you know where the links are. It's in the show notes. Go and you can check them out under your platform number two. And this is the part where I want to talk yeah. about because I, I love when people talk about mental health and on it in prior to you. And I'm going to read it verbatim here. This is on Susan's website. I will champion a stronger partnership with AHS to improve access to mental health supports for students. This is a key thing because I think kids are struggling right now because they may not be able to see their friends. So how do you envision that partnership? What does that partnership look like? And for the people of Ward 8 and 9 who are thinking about voting for you, how do you do that? How do you get that partnership with AHS started and going and moving forward? Well, one of the things is that um, after I had already done the first draft of this of this website, um, there was an announcement um, for from Connect the Dots YYC. That's the 2021-2023 Mental Health Action Plan for Calgary, um, Calgary's Mental Health and Addiction Strategy. And I was so pleased to see that come out because that means that rather than trying to convince people that something needs to happen or trying to lay the groundwork for something, there's something that's out there already that leaders in Calgary, city of Calgary leaders, AHS leaders, social workers, teachers, all these groups have already agreed on, on what needs to be done. So now it just needs to be done. So that is my plan. That that strategy, you can actually find a link to it um, from my website if you're uh, for the your listeners who are interested in reading about it. Um, it's a great strategy, and now it just the the key is, you know, strategies. People create strategies all the time. Uh, the implementation is the big key, right? How do you actually translate the words on in that document and the goodwill that is there between 
um, uh, Minister Jason Luan, Luan um, Associate Minister Jason Luan and <laughs> other people, and, and make sure that it actually means that kids have access to mental health supports. Um, yeah, what I mean, what I would love to see is, is much shorter wait times. When a principal or a teacher identifies that a student needs mental health supports, I would like to see much shorter wait times for that student than they're currently getting. So if I'm elected, part of that will be for me to understand what are the current wait times, what are the bottlenecks, and what is what what are we aiming to what are we aiming to um, reduce those to? Um, we have situations now like where if a student has a mental health crisis in a classroom, it's often the the school resource officer who's taking that kid into the emergency at, at Alberta Children's Hospital, and I don't know if that's the best skill set to have a school resource officer as opposed to a social worker. We have at the children's hospital, there are social workers who work at the children's hospital and who are available to families. Doctors help kids at the children's hospital, nurses help children at the children's hospital, but then sometimes when, when these health professionals are helping kids and their families, they get to a point where they say, well, actually, now what we need, the person we need now in the room is a social worker to talk about how we can best support you. And why don't we have that in the school system? I mean, partly it's cutbacks, right? But it, it, it shouldn't necessarily be even the CBE funding this. We should have, have access and, and open doors to mental health professionals in the school system. Now, before we get into the other part, parts of your platform, because I, I don't want to, I, I want to make sure that we cover a, a lot of topics in this discussion because uh, people are listening to this probably and thinking, okay, I want you to talk about other things besides COVID-19 because I, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's what their life is all about right now. And let's yeah. be honest, you have other things in your platform. So before I talk about your platform, which can be found on your website, I want to know when you first started this campaign, when you first started to door knock or talk with your neighbors, because I know COVID-19 has changed the name of how we campaign, how we actually talk to our neighbors. Right. Were there things that you were expecting to hear from your neighbors about the school board system that you heard? And were there things that you were shocked about when you heard from parents and said, I didn't think this was an issue but I'm glad you've brought it forward to my attention because I like to hear all opinions and not just what I might think is the issues that are facing our students and the Calgary Board of Education. Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, one that I'll tell you that surprised me and it, so, which is why it's not on my website in case everyone, anyone's wondering why is this not one of my top five priorities? is people started talking to me about school closures. And I said, oh no, you must be mistaken. <laughs> like that's an issue from the nineties or the early two thousands people were talking about school <laughs> closures. But now everyone knows that if you close a school in a neighborhood then a few years down the road, the population, the demographics change again and then there's not enough space for students. So we, I think at this point, 2021, we know we're not supposed to close down schools. And then people were saying, no, no, it's a thing. Like, I'm worried about Ramsey School. I'm worried about this school. And I, I, so I looked into it. And sure enough, there's a list of 16 schools that over the next 10 years, potentially, um, depending on demographics, could potentially be closed. So <laughs> that is an issue that was not at all on my radar and is now on my radar. And, and for sure, it's something that I, I will... Um, I will fight to keep schools open because like I said, the demographics change. And so the schools need to be there for when the next generation um, uh, is ready to, to enter the school doors. If I'm elected, one of the things I wanna do is to revitalize. There used to be a committee that worked between the city of Calgary, the, the city of Calgary planners and community associations and, and schools like on a very local level to, to um, work on, on keeping schools vibrant. And I wanted to revitalize that because ultimately the CBE can't afford to run schools that don't have enrollment. So, so a school closure issue is in part an enrollment, an enrollment issue. And one of the ways to address that is to connect directly with the community and connect directly with the people who are vocal and active and, and excited about their community and passionate about their communities 
and and work with those local those local at the neighbor level working with people to make sure that when kids have kids if people have kids who are school age that they know um, that they know facts about this CBE that, that people need to know that the CBE has one of the most effective school systems in the world sometimes for some reason I sometimes hear public education beat up and I think that's based on perceptions from other parts of the world but here in Alberta the CBE CBE students rank among the top in the world on international standardized tests in math reading science uh, it's it's a it's an excellent school system to send kids to. That's why I send my kids to CBE schools, and I'm proud to send my kids to CBE schools. A little bit of a gut check here, right? Like when we're talking about about um, hiring, like we know that uh, hiring Albertans, it's Albertans are one of the most highly skilled workers in the world. People like to hire Albertans, so obviously they're coming up through the school system. So I'm surprised that there's this disconnect where most employers would agree that Albertans are highly skilled and that's why we have such a robust economy. And then yet people beat up the school system that that <laughs> worked those same people through the system. So there's a bit of disconnect there. And I think that at a community level, we could be doing a better job of, of sharing the amazing story of, of how well CBE students do and what, a, what strong academic standards we have. Uh, talking about academic standards and how great this uh, a CBE is, I, I, I will be honest, I didn't go through the system. I'm an Ontario transplant. I'm from Ontario. I moved here in 2013. So I, do, I wasn't there in the school system. One of the thing, one of the priorities on your uh, on your platform on your website is uh, I will advocate and I'm quoting here. I will advocate for a new curriculum that prepares our children to thrive. What do you mean by that? Because the province, as you said, the province is the one that implements the education curriculum. You didn't say that, but it is it is what it is. They have impl they have introduced a new curriculum for this uh, school system in Alberta. Uh, the Calgary Board of Education has says no, we will not test pilot this new curriculum that the province has put forward. What type of new curriculum are you talking about? Are you talking about the one that the Kenny government has introduced or are you talking about another one or what does the new curriculum look like to you? Yes, yeah, so, so as you said, the, in March, 2021, the provincial government uh, released a K to six draft curriculum. And uh, just to catch up, I'm, I'm sure lots of your listeners know, but just to, to just catch up everyone up. In uh, September of this year, so right now, September 2021, a few school boards are piloting this. And then in September 2022, it's at this point, the plan is to roll it out across the whole province. So um, I am strongly against this draft curriculum. Experts have identified a number of critical flaws with it. And the shocking thing is that 50, 57 or 58, I, I keep hearing different numbers, but uh, the vast majority, 57 or 58 of 61 school boards across the province are not participating in the pilot. That is huge. That is a huge red flag. And, and just as, a, as a, a point, the CBE, as the largest school board in Western Canada, has a tendency to be the one that will volunteer whenever there's a pilot of anything, like when there's like new software being rolled out for school boards to try out all sorts of ideas. The school board, the CBE is usually first in line to pilot something. So the fact that the CBE and every other major school board in Alberta said no is a huge red flag. Um, and it's a flawed curriculum. <laughs> and we, it, it just, it cannot be, be brought into our classrooms in September 2022. So I, I will fight hard against it. It is ultimately a provincial government responsibility. You are right about that. But uh, trustees do have a, have a, a platform um, through which we can advocate for the best <laughs> needs of, of kids and families. And the thing is, so there's a few things that really strike me with this, <laughs> with this whole curriculum saga that it just strikes strike me as a bit bizarre. So first, getting buy-in for a revised curriculum should have been a relatively straightforward task because everyone knew we needed an updated curriculum. This is just a standard thing that happens. It's not a political issue. This is just normal. I, this happens in every industry. There's continuous improvement. You're constantly searching for best practices. How can we even do, how can we do better? So everyone knew that we needed to 
update parts of the curriculum, like um, the science of reading is, is a, it's this SOR, science of reading for, for people who, whose kids have a learning disabilities, though so those families would be very familiar with that with that buzzword, but it's it's a way of, of um, reaching kids who are currently struggling how to learn how to read. So everyone agreed that needed to be in there. Um, consent needed to be in there, financial literacy, coding, like there were all these things that everyone agreed needed to be improved. And, and yet, the, and, and it, so there was all teachers were ready to say yes, parents were ready to say yes, and yet the, the uh, government of Alberta somehow released a curriculum that is making people angry, which is, so here they had this golden opportunity to release something where everyone would say, oh, that's wonderful, thank you. And instead they made people angry. So it's an unnecessary political controversy. I'm really struck by how this is, you know, COVID as a political controversy, was foisted on us. We have that, and no one asked for the for yeah. the COVID political controversy, but it is there. This curriculum political controversy is just a made up made up problem that doesn't need to be a problem. The other the other thing is that I'm just struck by how I, I just the UCP should, needs to start seeing parents as partners in education. And as a trustee, if I'm elected, I know very well that. I need to see parents as partners in education. So I'm surprised that the provincial government doesn't, doesn't do that because we want the new curriculum to be successful. And in order to be successful, it must enjoy the broad support of Albertans, which it doesn't. And then the final thing, if I'm elected, you know, I'm, I'm gonna hammer home a lesson that I share with my kids as a parent, that sometimes it is okay to stop. Sometimes it's okay to say, we got this wrong. It's not a sign of weakness to take a step back. It's a sign of maturity and it's a sign of strength. Um, I, I appreciate your honesty there because I, I feel like the next school board uh, council or for, or I shouldn't say school board council, but the next board of education for Calgary is going to have a challenge on their hands. And we need people who are willing to be honest and willing to say no. So I appreciate that. Uh, one last area I want to talk about before we move on to sort of the you your role as the school next school board trustee for Ward 8 and 9. And that is oversized classrooms. It is priority number one for you. If I am elected, yeah. I will push back against oversized classrooms. Now, you talk to anyone on my street who's a parent who have kids that go to school, you ask them what is an oversized classroom. They will give you 10 different answers. One will say more than 10 people, more than 20 people, more than 22 people, more than 18 people, or kids, I should say, students. In your opinion, in your words, what is an oversized classroom? Well, I'm going to go back to uh, the provincial government on this one. And again, <laughs> this is another example. This is another example of something where ultimately it's in the hands of the, of the government of Alberta, the, the people we elect to be MLAs in our province, that they get to decide what budgets to allocate to the, to the um, CBE. Uh, and then the CBE has to work with what we get. And, and there's been now 10 or 15 years straight of, of fiscal restraint where, where um, prior to 2019, there were there was no increase in per student funding for 10 or 11 years and then in 20 and that was under conservative government ndp government and then ucp government and then in 2019 the ucp in addition to that made a budget cut to education and in addition to that said this is this budget cut is not a budget cut which is the hardest kind of budget cut to deal with right when you're dealing with no budget cut to see here that that's really challenging are really challenging to work with when when that's the case when there's no ownership of of of, of a cut to to the per student funding. Um, but what would I like to see? Back to the question. So what would I like to see? I take it back to in 2003, the Conservative government. We had a Conservative uh, government in in power in, in the government of Alberta in 2003, and they released a report, um, the Alberta Commission on Learning, and they they had experts look into it and and they said. What we should be aiming for is 17 students per class from kindergarten to grade three. And those are the years when the kids are learning to read. And then 23 kids per class in grades four to six. And those are the years when kids are mastering the art of 
reading to learn, it's the opposite of learning to read. Then in grade seven to nine, 25 kids per class. And those are the years when the academic expectation, expectations really begin to take off. Uh, I, I know with my kids, that uh, once they hit those, those grades, my goodness, the, <laughs> the academic rigor and the, and the, the uh, things they're working on, it gets really serious in, that, in those grades. And then 27 kids per class in those crucial high school years when kids are trying to prepare for whatever is coming next for them in their, in their lives. So I'm going to follow up with this because you, you seem to know the numbers and you seem to enjoy a policy like I do. And it's it's great when I, 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 I have someone I can bounce these things off of. But what is the average class size, class size right now in this uh, Calgary Board of Education? Do you know? I don't know the answer to that question. And of course, it would depend on uh, the grade level, right? Mm. And it would depend on uh, as well... Uh, various factors. There are CBE classrooms in our city that are very small with, and they have students with very complex needs. And then there are classrooms that can handle higher, higher class sizes as well. Like it's like, um, so it's, there's no set of the no non-core level. objects in the high school level, right? I'm, I'd be okay with, with, uh, with higher class sizes. So all I can just do with, with is what I'm hearing at the doors when I'm door knocking. And, you know, if, if people are mad that uh, they've had in the past few years, in the past two years, class sizes where there are 31 kids in grade one, for example, and, and several of them are, are English as a second language learners or coded for learning disability, like 31 in grade one, or, or um, I know one of my kids had, I was 38 kids in, in her uh, grade uh, six class if you, uh, in 2019. It was just an overwhelming number of kids. It's, it, it's gotten to a level where the, the we're so far away from the recommendations from the 2003 report that we're actually reaching numbers where 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 people who who look at these sorts of things educational experts they haven't even looked at those numbers because they didn't think anyone would go there i i'm still flabbergasted that 30 one 38 kids in one classroom that just, grade six yes my child's that, grade six classroom yeah. I thought I thought Ontario was bad when I had 25 kids in my grade six class. We get it, get yeah. it's a completely different uh, era and different province, but yeah. I, I, I feel bad for the teacher. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> I, I remember when I was yeah. in grade six and how much of a handful I was. So um, I, I want to turn now because we're about, the, oh, we're almost at the 30 minute mark, which I can't believe we're already at, but I want to talk now about your role as the school board trustee. We've talked about policy, which is great. Now let's talk about your role. You, you mentioned it earlier on in the interview. I think it was actually one of the first two answers that you gave me during the interview. You, you said you have heard a variety of opinions. You have heard a variety of opinions on a variety of topics when you're talking to parents. Your role as the school board trustee will to be to make the final decision. You are the final decision. You and the board will make that final decision on many issues, whether it be masking in, masking in classrooms, whether it be mandatory vaccinations, who knows, curriculum, so on and so forth, budget cuts, all that. I want to know from you right here, right now, how do you balance the needs of the many against the needs of your conscience? Because if people come to you, if there's a majority of people who say, I, I want you to overturn the mask bylaw mandate because it, it's hurting my child. And you know, and I'm not sure what your opinion on it, you might want to say it here, but you, you know, it, it's for the health and safety of our children, we need it. How do you balance that? How do I balance that um, when there when there are I mean it, that's going to be pretty much every issue right is well it, how, it, it, exactly yeah. how do you balance what you hear at the door because if you like I said if you talk to every person in ward eight and nine they will give you their opinion and their opinion believe is what they believe is the correct opinion how mm -hmm. do you take that information that you gathered from talking to your uh, res uh, constituents and bring it forward to the CBE board and say, okay, I now need to make the best decision based on what I've heard at the door. And it might upset so, me. 
Yeah, so this is this is actually where my professional background and my and my educational training come in. I, I have a political science degree where I happen to graduate at the top of my class, although nobody cares. <laughs> and then I oh, have an I MBA. did because I took political science and I was not at the top of my class. So good for you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you care. Thank you, Chris Brown, for caring. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> and I also have an MBA and. Um, literally, I had a job doing this work for for about 10 years before I stepped back to be a, more of a stay at home parent and, and a community, the super community volunteer. Um, so I used to be a policy analyst in the government of Alberta up in Edmonton. And then um, and my, where, when I left Edmonton, I was a policy manager in the premier's office, actually, in during the Ralph Klein era. And then I, oh, goodness gracious, <laughs> then I moved to uh, Calgary, where I, I worked with the city of Calgary for several years. Um, and uh, I, I ended up as a issue strategist with the city manager's office. And then I've also done private sector consulting as well uh, for the private, public and not-for-profit sectors. So my whole paid career, portion of my career was doing just this, was taking different strands and weaving together a single decision. And uh, it, is, it is complex because when you're making decisions as a trustee, um, you're not a scientist, you, you're, a, it's, it's different. So you can't just look at raw data as a trustee. You also have to consider the public mood and, and um, public perceptions. I, that is a key too, right? Public perceptions, which are technically not reality-based. And then there's data, which is reality-based. But a skilled policy analyst, policy wonk, um, a trustee won't will will consider them both rather than one to the exclusion of others. So it's an art. It's an art, not a science. How to make those decisions? But because I have that experience, I know how to do it. When I know how to do it. And let me just one thing that I just wanted to point out because the, um, in relation to the masking that that's come up, is that we just have to be very aware that there's people who have a very strong emotional uh, response and feeling about vaccinations and masking, but it is a minority. 70% of Calgarians are double vaccinated or 70% of Calgarians 12 and up or uh, Albertans actually, the number might be higher in, Cal in among Calgarians for all I know, but it's a, the vast majority of people in Alberta are double vaccinated and who, who can be vaccinated and the vast majority, like even leading up to the, in August, I was hearing all of this, I was getting all of these anti-masking emails to my inbox as, um, as a candidate. And I was, you know, on, on my social media feeds, I was aware of the protest that was, that was planned on that first day of school. And I, I was hearing all of this noise. And I went to that first day of school, dropping off my kids at, at, at uh, two different schools. And I was prepared, you know, if I saw, protesters at my kid's school and they were like you know interfering with anything like but there was nothing all I saw though that first day of school were happy parents happy children wearing those masks that we all hate like I don't know I've never met a single person who loves the masks but we're just getting on with it we're just making it happen and so I did want to just tell you what I am hearing about at the doors when I'm door knocking or just talking with constituents at at events before events were cancelled last week but <laughs> so what I'm what I'm really hearing is that lately I'm hearing the mood of the public has really turned so I'm noticing there's increasingly little tolerance for for uh, basically the molly coddling on display towards the vaccine hesitant and, and people are just kind of getting frustrated that we're prolonging a full recovery from this crisis when this could be we could be not this deep into a fourth wave so the those calgarians who are vaccinated which is again the majority we've had it with with mask mandates and shutdowns during this fourth wave that are purely being implemented to avoid overwhelming our healthcare system by the vaccine hesitance. So people who are getting in touch with me are mad that, that we haven't done more, not, not that we're doing too much. And I'm also hearing from parents um, that this school year has to be about school, about academic growth, about social growth, about seeing friends. Um, people are talking about fun, play, friendship, ambition. You know, those are the words I'm hearing. So people 
people are like, fine, I'll put a mask on my kid and I'll send my kid with a mask. Let's talk about school. That, that's what people care about when, 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 I'm, when I'm door knocking and meeting with constituents. And, and the uh, uh, final thing I'll say is that the vast majority of parents I've met over these past few weeks support the CBE's decision to have both students and staff wear masks. Um, at this time, especially with with the uh, with the where the case numbers are right now, um, and people want uh, parents are looking for a certain level of safety and certainty. Especially, there's many families who until now have have not had a, a case of COVID within their families due to their diligence, and they don't want to lose that now when we're so close so close to the finish line. So, the vast majority of parents. Um, are 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 um, on board with what's happening now, but also the vast majority of parents want all want want these gone as soon as possible, right? But when is as soon as possible? I don't know, but I'm also aware that at some point, you know, at some point, is it after the five to eleven year olds have had the opportunity to be vaccinated. I don't. I don't know. But at some point, we also have to keep an eye out for when can we phase out the cohorting. When can we phase out the masking? When can we have parents volunteering in schools again? And recitals. I miss those yeah. <laughs> Christmas <laughs> recitals. Come on. Um, yeah. uh, I just want to ask. I want you to jump in a time machine with me and we're going to put ourselves on October 19th, the day after the election. So on October okay. 18th, you have been declared the council, sorry, the trustee designate for Ward 8 and 9 for the Calgary Board of Education. You what a wake lovely, up, happy future. <laughs> exactly. You wake up on October 19th after a fun night of just partying and just enjoying yourself because you, all the hard work you've done. What is now priority number one for you on October 19th? Um, building a strong team. Because if you have seven, there's seven uh, trustees who are on the board of directors. And if those seven people don't get along, oh, it's a world of trouble. <laughs> so that is like, It's like one. you're talking about the city council of this year. <laughs> um. How do you build that strong team? Because every, you, we don't know how the chips are going to fall in the school board election because there are people running for re-election. There are people running for uh, to be the next councillor, uh, next trustee, sorry. How do you build a strong team with a variety of opinions and backgrounds that are going to be coming onto that board in uh, October, October 19th? Well, um, so so you need uh, basically to just follow what the experts say to do when you're trying to build a high performing team, right? I mean, it's it's not rocket science and there's well established ways of doing it. So first things first is to get a clear unity of what is our purpose. So what is the mission of the CBE? There's a few people running for CBE who don't understand what it is. So we need to all be on the same board of what does the CBE do? It's, it provides public education through CBE schools to, to students in Calgary. Some people are mixing up <laughs> between the CBE and the government of Alberta and Alberta education. So what, why, do, why does the CBE exist? And the vision, like what impact do we hope to achieve? Again, there there's, are a few candidates running for public school trustee who are running on a platform of a bit of a nihilistic nihilistic how do you pronounce that word nihilistic i think nihilistic nihilistic uh platform like a bull in a china shop where they their plan is to go in and destroy the cbe well that's one vision of what we would like for the cbe the other vision is the one that's actually stated currently um on the cbe's website and um oh it's escaping me right now but basically it's about <laughs> the success of our students right that is actually the vision that we should all be rallying around so Let's get a clear unity of purpose. Um, let's get um, people comfortable with um, expressing their feelings um, freely. Um, we need to establish a, an atmosphere where people feel that it's okay to have disagreement because that's actually a good thing. That's what you want from your board of trustees. You want people to push back against each other a little bit and say, well, no, actually I, I've been hearing this or no, what about we, we need to consider this? It, you, you need, you need to, and, um, 
an atmosphere where, for the team where there's this sense that it's okay to express an opinion that people think others might not agree with. Um, and we need to get everyone to understand that the decisions at a board level are made at a point where there's general agreement. So everyone needs to, once, there's, once the board has made a decision, everyone needs to be prepared to back it. There's no like trying to undermine from behind. <laughs> because that's just how board work works and um and yeah and making sure that people carry and talking about the importance of people carrying their weight as, as a group as well coming to meetings now uh, as a business owner myself uh as someone who's worked in projects as someone who's worked in politics like yourself you know you have to put metrics into place to ensure that you are successful as in going into your new job or into your new position. So I'm going to ask you this because I've asked all candidates, municipal and uh, school board trustee. So that way in a year's time, I can come back to you and say, hey, let's have a year recap and see if you've hit these metrics. What metrics are you going to put in place for the first year to ensure that you have begun, started, or have, have accomplished some of the priorities that you have outlined in your platform. So one is, what are the class sizes now? You asked an excellent question. I didn't know the answer. So find out the answer to that question. What are the class sizes now? And then what is what is a reasonable um, goal to, to, to work towards? And then achieve that. So the class size is one. Is one. Um, two is uh, funding. So we know what the current funding is. If I would consider it a win if I could convince the government of Alberta with a strong business case why it's important to uh, invest in public education. I, I, if I can convince our elected MLAs that an investment in public education is an investment in Alberta's prosperity, then I'll consider that a win. Um, a, another one will be, I want to understand the metrics that we have now for mental health access. So where are the gaps? Like, what are the measurable, like you say, the, the numbers, like what are the wait lists? Are there certain um, demographics around the students who are having a harder time um, getting the mental health supports they need? And then, and then having positive change in that. Um, there's another one of my pri priorities is PUF funding, pro program unit funding, which is, um, funding it, it, which funds support uh, for developmental therapies for children with significant challenges affecting their ability to learn or manage school. So these are this is for young children. And the idea is that when there's early inter when kids are provided with early intervention therapies when they're four or five six years old, um, when those concerns are identified early and they're addressed early, then there's a positive impact on kids' functional outcomes. Like kids just do better. And, and without that support, their outcomes are not as good and the costs to society are higher in the long term. So um, I'd like to see uh, the, the, the funding cut that the uh, current provincial government did to puff funding reverse. That would be another solid metric that I could use. Um, I, I mean, the curriculums, that's just a yes, no. Do, do we have a curriculum that, that gets widespread buy-in from the experts, right, from educational experts? And um, I, there's, there's other ones, too, that are, hard, that are very important to me, but, but harder to measure. But just because they're not measured doesn't mean that they're harder to measure, that they're, hard, that they're not important. So we're not doing we're I, I can see that the CBE was working really hard on diversity inclusion and in, in improving diversity and inclusion and and equity I'm 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 very proud of what what I see the CBE doing and in, in terms of uh, celebrating it, it, indigenous culture that that we that that is a part of our history here and is also part of our present here in Calgary um, fighting against xenophobia, making LGBTQ plus, uh, 2S students feel uh, that they're welcome in CBE, CBE schools. We're doing, I think we're doing a great job, but I know we could be doing better. So, but how can we be doing better? I don't know if there's a measurable metric there, if there's like a number, but, but we still have to keep improving. We can't, we can't, um, it just has to be a priority. So, that's why it's went up there as one of my top priorities. So that's a tricky one where there isn't always a measurable metric, but that doesn't mean that it that it doesn't need to be taken care of as well. 
that's just a few of the oh and then there's also actually you know the other one too it's huge so currently the administrative costs um at the cbe are uh 2.8 percent of, of the budget which is low even by private sector standards but as a fiscal conservative, I'd like to make sure that that number stays low. So I certainly, that's one of my, my metrics as well, is can we keep it at that 2.8% so that the vast majority of the budget goes directly into the classrooms? Perfect. Awesome. Now, uh, because I'm cautious of time here and you have other things to do, it's election day. And I, I, yeah. I can imagine, well, not election day for those who are listening to this in October, yeah. but election day as we're recording this and you need to get out and put up some signs, as you said. Um, I, I got to ask the question. I want you to look at the camera, talk to the people of Ward 8 and 9 who are listening to this right now. Why should you be the next school board trustee for the great Calgary Board of Education for wards eight and nine. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Um, well, I feel that I should be the next uh, school board trustee for wards eight and nine because I really care about kids and, and Calgary's families. And I'm the wow. best person for the job. I think when I look to at the, at the uh, people who are running against me, I mean, one of them, uh doesn't uh one of them is trying to start her, a, a, a different school board monica and she doesn't have sent she has never sent her kids to the cbe and she does not currently send her kids to the cbe so and she's starting to trying to start her own school board so she doesn't understand that it's alberta education that makes those decisions not the cbe um we are a school board it, it'd be like trying to start a new airline and trying to get on the board of directors with with WestJet to to try to start your new airline it's, it's just um a not not a good scene the then there's another um candidate uh David also doesn't have kids uh in the CBE and uh is working in a lab at the U of C full-time so he'd be doing this off the corner of his desk whereas I'm ready to commit you know like this is this is my my pure focus for the next uh four years if I'm elected um, there's another person, Slobodan, who just threw his name into the ring a few days ago. No website, no, no information. So I think he's just doing it for a lark, whereas I take this role incredibly seriously. I'm running and I'm, I, you know, like the, the, I, I registered to run in this race uh, in February, February 17th. So for six months, it was just me out there door knocking, meeting constituents, talking to people working on my campaign and uh, taking time away from my family to work on this campaign because I, I care about, about the future of our public education system. Um, and then, yeah, it seems like then former people just in the last few weeks put their name in the hat. And, and I still look, I look at what they're offering and what I'm offering. And I, I have deeper experience. I've done more years of volunteer work with the school system. I, I have that background. Um, as a policy wonk and and a, and a consultant, and I I can hit the ground running and I can just get it done. Awesome. Um, now there are probably people yelling at their car radio listening to this on their drive down the deer foot. There's probably people yelling at their uh, TV, uh, their their computer screens, watching this on YouTube because I didn't ask a question that was on the top of their heads. So for the people of Ward 8 and 9 who want to reach out and ask a question to you, because that's what this election is all about, getting educated and learning about the candidates, how can people reach out to you? How can people uh, contact you and ask the questions that we haven't discussed here? Um, you can send me an email. So my email address is Susan Vukadinovich at gmail.com. So that's S U S A N V as in Victor U K A D I N O V I C at gmail.com. Susan Vukadinovich V U K A D I N O V I C. <laughs> <laughs> um, for my listeners and to my viewers, the links to Susan's website and that email address. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm just making sure uh, social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Yeah, LinkedIn, LinkedIn Instagram, LinkedIn. Facebook, Twitter. I'm on all of them. TikTok will be coming at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> 
Uh, as a, a person who is older than I don't know what, but TikTok will never be linked on my show notes. I do not understand it, but if you have it, go follow her. I'm not linking it in the show notes, but her social media, her email, uh, her website will be in the show notes. So Susan, I thank you so much. Um, this has been an honor and a pleasure. I, 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 I love when people like yourself put their name forward who are honest, sincere, and passionate about the role that they want to get elected in. Um, I wish you the best of luck on October 18th. And to my listeners and my viewers, you know what I'm going to say. You've heard it numerous times over the last two months. Get out, get educated, and vote. If you do not vote, I do not want to see you complaining on social media for the next four years that you're the person that you is elected doesn't represent your values. If you do not vote, you do not get to uh, uh, complain. Susan, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris Brown, for interviewing me.